Welcome to Renolda Church. Please take just a minute to fill out the Connect card that you received when you arrived. Let us know how we can pray for you and your family this week. Here at Renolda, we work together and we pray together. And the Connect card is a great way for us to stay in touch across all of our congregations. Women of Renolda, it's almost time for our IF Gathering 2023. That's taking place on March 3rd and 4th. You do not want to miss this incredible event. Join us for two days of powerful worship, fantastic fellowship, and dynamic Bible teaching as we join with other women all over the world. You'll enjoy dinner and a time of fellowship on Friday night, breakfast and lunch on Saturday, plus all of the wonderful teaching and worship content. So grab a friend and join women from all of our campuses and what is sure to be a highlight of your year. Use the link below to learn more and uh, space is limited, so make sure that you register today. Calling all Renolda students, it is time to register for the best weekend of the year. That's right, DNOW 2023 is happening on March 24th and 25th. The opening session on Friday will have food, games, music, and a big surprise. Saturday, we'll have breakfast together and we'll be joined by an awesome guest speaker. And of course, we'll have more music, more food, and more fun. We're helping out a local ministry with a serve opportunity, and we're gonna have a lot of offsite fun and adventure. Needless to say, it's going to be a pretty big deal. So high school and middle school students, get signed up today, use the link below and register. Believe it or not, Easter is almost here, and we are excited to launch the Path to Easter 2023 that's taking place on March 12th. Uh, we're gonna gather in groups, and for the next four weeks leading up to Easter, uh, participants will receive daily scripture readings and a reflection guide, and the passages selected will help you journey from Gethsemane's betrayal all the way to encounters with the resurrected Christ. And we'll make weekly thematic connections with our Romans sermon series. So if you're interested in getting the most out of our resurrection celebration, this is a great opportunity for you. Use the link below to find a group that fits you. Again, we are so glad, we are honored that you've joined us today. Let's worship together. Greetings, blessings, everybody, all of our campuses. So glad to be with you and everybody joining us online as well. Are you ready for some good news? You can't save yourself at all. Not at all. And the reason that's good news is that the realization and admission of how much you need a Savior that is the beginning point of your rescue. Years ago, psychologist, author, famous James Dobson said his boy Ryan was little and he was a pretty rambunctious kid. And one day when uh, Dobson was home, uh, uh, his wife wasn't there. And so he was watching Ryan and all of a sudden he got too quiet. So he started looking around for the little boy, looked in every room in the house, couldn't find him. He looked through the kitchen window and saw that little Ryan had somehow uh, managed to climb up into the bed of a truck that some construction workers had parked in their driveway. Uh, Dobbins said he had no idea how he got up into this truck bed that was higher than the little boy's head, but he had now positioned himself so that he had kind of squirmed down and was hanging there from waist down, his legs dangling a couple feet above the ground, and he was just stuck. So Dobson went out there to rescue his son, and as he was slipping up behind him to take hold of him, and the little boy didn't know his dad was there yet, Dobson overheard the little boy saying to himself, 
somebody help the boy. <laughs> he kept saying, won't somebody just come help the boy? And uh, of course, Dobbs have got him down and got really tickled. And uh, if you think about your life and you think about what you really have needed, you've always needed somebody to help you. I think rescue stories are inspiring. And uh, so I was uh, riveted by uh, Ron Howard's movie, 13 Lives, came out recently tells the story of um, 12 soccer players, ages 11 to 16, and their assistant coach, who after practice in their home in Thailand one day, went to explore the Tam Luang Cave with all of its different compartments and its labyrinthine ways. And uh, there was going to be a birthday party later, but the assistant coach thought that'd be a fun thing to do. So they all biked over there and they went in to explore the cave. This is in 2018. Monsoon season starts at the end of July, and this was in June, so there shouldn't be any problem with that. But it came early that year. And while they were in the recesses of the cave, the rains began to fall. And, of course, they were unaware of how the tributaries and the underground water and all of it began to seep in and then began to flood into the massive cave. When they made their way back to the cave, towards the cave entrance, they realized they had now um, become blocked by the flood and they could not make their way. So they retreated and retreated as the waters continued to fill until they're at a back part of the cave, some two and a half miles away from the entrance. And nobody knew they were there. And they had no food or water or provisions. And they settled up into a rocky, higher elevated place. The coach at one point decided he would try to swim. They had a long rope. He held on to it. The currents were too strong. It was too deep. And beside it, it filled the cave with water. So there was no air pocket. There was nowhere to, to rest on the, on the journey back to the entrance of the cave. So people, parents and others, wondering where their kids were, began searching. Someone saw the bikes and their backpacks at the entrance to the cave, and they realized what had happened. They didn't know if they were alive or not. The rains had started, and they seemed relentless. The, the Navy SEALs of Thailand came, and though they were brave and skilled in underwater diving and swimming maneuvers. No one had ever been diving in a cave before. And someone ventured towards it and came back and said it was impassable. And what were they going to do? Thankfully, there was a British cave explorer who lived nearby and a resident there in Thailand who knew this cave very well. So he came and met with the seals and he began to draw out for them a diagram and show them all of the different conduits and compartments and rooms in this, this massive cave that began to help them. And he suggested to them that they uh, contact two British cave divers, whoever knew that such a thing even existed. But there are just a few of these men in the world that were highly experienced at diving in caves that have been filled with water. It's completely different than scuba diving in an ocean or a, a body of water. And so they called in these two men who were ex-firefighters, one an electrician by day, the other IT, uh, had an IT job. And so they were cave divers by avocation. And uh, they brought them in. They flew in and they evaluated the situation and realized it was incredibly unlikely that they would ever find these boys or this coach. Nobody was paying them. The, meanwhile, the whole village began cooperating, people trying to work with local uh, experts to divert water away from the cave and, and, and build new channels and streams that would eventually flood the the farmlands around it because they were trying to, as a village, people save these, these lives. 
On the tenth day, the two cave divers, they had managed to make it on about a six-hour dive to the very end. And when they came up, there were these 12 boys and their coach all alive. There is real footage of this, and uh, what a moment to see this. And then the real crisis, how in the world would they ever get them back to safety? These boys that were malnourished and weakened from 10 days of isolation in a cave, how could they take these panicky boys through a two and a half, half mile journey, six plus hours underwater and get them to safety. Meanwhile, the rains continued relentlessly. And so uh, the real crisis was at hand. And what they did to save those boys, their idea was absolutely crazy. I'll come back to it later if you don't know the story. It's astounding what they did. It's gripping when there is someone who's willing to make a rescue at great personal peril, it is something that uh, we can find our souls riveted at because perhaps we all know that down deep within us, we all need that kind of rescue. I'm wondering, like, have you ever had to get rescued? And you probably say, well, no, I've never been stuck in a cave. I've never been in some place where I was trapped and I had to, you know, most people would say, no, I hadn't. But, you know, I was thinking about this when we went to babysit for a grandbaby Mia on Valentine's Day and uh, taking care of this four month old, which is so fun and reminds me, it just takes me right back to parenting our own newborns. And it reminds me how odd of God to design the world that we come into the world utterly helpless. And you put a baby in a crib, and when the baby wakes up and the baby is hungry, there's only one way the baby will be fed, and that is that someone comes to her rescue. So in a real sense, every single one of us has been rescued a thousand times because if someone had not come to you and fed you, and changed you, and cared for you, then you would have never, ever made it. We're, we're all in the same predicament naturally. And what we see in Romans chapter 3 is Paul building his argument, this logical and beautiful flow of thought that is going to carry us on to Romans 8 and then carry us on to chapters about how then we shall live when we discover how freeing it is that there's no condemnation for Christ and the power of a spirit-filled life. But now in Romans 3, he's taking what he has taught at the end of Romans 1 and throughout Romans 2, and he's putting this together and it's beginning to coalesce, it's beginning to see this as we begin to understand that all have sinned, that all are in a predicament. In a sense, what he's saying is that we're very much like those trapped boys in that cave. In a spiritual sense that our sin has caused us to have such a massive separation from God and that none of us, none of us can make our way back to God. None of us can save ourselves and we need a rescue. Let's pick this up and look at it chapter, uh, uh, paragraph by paragraph, starting in verse 1 then what advantage has the Jew or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So Paul has previously talked about the the outward sign of the covenant, circumcision, as uh, something that some of his Jewish readers may have put trust in, that the outward and the external is some sort of guarantee of my relationship with God. And he's made the point, he said, no, it's not the outside, it's the inside. 
And it's the work of God inside of us. And so now he turns to the sense and he says, well, is there an advantage if you were in the, uh, the people, the Hebrew people? He said, yes, he says there is, because they were given the very revelation of God of the Torah and the prophets. They were given uh, wisdom. So there's nothing bad, he says, about being given the good gift of God's word. And there's nothing bad about God. And so God never gives bad gifts. And so the fact that the Jewish people had the law, it was a good gift. And this is important if you're going to understand everything he has to say in Romans by the time we get into chapters 5 and, and 6 and, uh, and 7. Romans chapter 3, verse 3. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it's written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you're judged. So, what Paul's saying here, if God was good and faithful in giving his word, given his law, but people were unfaithful to the law, does that mean that God's gift wasn't faithful and good? Does, in fact, the unfaithfulness of the people uh, mean that God somehow is unfaithful? And Paul says, no. In fact, the unfaithfulness of the people is actually accentuating the faithfulness of God. There's a way in which the sin of the people is making God's truth shine all the more. Verse 5, but if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? as some slanderously charge us with saying that their condemnation is just. So here Paul is saying, if you say that my unfaithfulness puts God's faithfulness on display, that in a sense my sin actually makes God's glory shine all the more, then God shouldn't judge me because of my sin, because it's actually serving to glorify God. And Paul says, no, that's nonsense. It's utterly illogical to say that. So it's illogical to say that because God's word was righteous, but some people were unfaithful, that there's something unfaithful about God. And it's equally illogical to say that because your unfaithfulness puts God's faithfulness on display, that somehow you shouldn't need to be judged. Verse 9, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it's written, none is righteous no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. So what Paul is saying is to the Jewish people that if you think that you're under uh, somehow a different uh, relationship with God because you had the law or because you had circumcision, he's saying, no, Here's, the, here's what he's been leading to in chapter 2 also. Every single person, he says, is under sin. All. It means that there are not some that have um, the capacity to in some way save themselves because they are better than other people. He's saying we're all in the exact same predicament. All are lost and need to be found. All are trapped and can't escape on their own. All are stuck with their own selfishness and their own blinders and cannot escape except they have a rescuer. So what, what we're seeing here is that there really are two categories uh, of, of person. There are those that are under sin and those that are under grace. And to be under sin is not really talking about the individual sins. Yeah, some people commit more heinous sins than other people. That's true. Not everybody is, lives an equally moral or immoral life. That's true. But what Paul's saying here is this condition of sin, which you can think of is separation from God because of spiritual deadness on the inside of us. Spiritual blindness, can't see. We're all, he says, under sin. We're all in that condition. And this goes far to explain, therefore, why in a deep sense, Though we don't all live the same morally equivalent life, we're all in the same condition. So like these, like these boys, 12 of them, and a coach, 
and they were under a monsoon. They were under a flood. They were, they were entrapped. They were, they were, it was dark. It was completely flooded. They had no oxygen mask. They had no, they had no food. Now, I don't know if any of these boys were good swimmers. I don't know if some of them couldn't swim at all. But let's just say that they had a, a varying abilities to swim. And maybe there's one boy who he can't swim. And so if he starts to try to swim through the murky, heavy currents of the floodwaters in the cave, then he might not make it 10 feet before he drowns because he can't swim. Now, let's say there's another boy, and he is a pretty good swimmer. He's spent time swimming in, in the surf and in the lakes, and he, he, he knows how to manage himself. And maybe uh, he could probably swim 100 yards without being too exhausted if it was still water. But, but this is two and a half miles. And so he tries to swim and, and, and can't make it more than 100 yards before he drowns. But let's say that there is a boy, maybe the oldest one in there, 16-year-old, was, was, was excellent swimmer, national caliber, potential Olympian swimmer, who uh, is the kind of swimmer that could swim as well as anybody in the world, perhaps. And, and, and he could, on a calm day in good waters where he can catch his breath and has air to lift his head up, he could swim for miles. But this isn't that situation. This is a situation where there is no air. This is a situation two and a half miles of complete darkness through waters that you can't navigate. So even the best swimmer, if he swam, maybe he could make it a half a mile before he would drown. But the point being is they were all in the same predicament. No matter the good swimmer, the poor swimmer, or that in between, they had the same predicament. They can't make it out. They would all drown if they tried to get out by their own effort. I think this is what Paul's saying. There may be some people you see, and they do a lot of good things with their life, and, and morally, they, they, they ethically seem to be far better than other people who do horrible things with their life. But in the end, because the, the, the gulf of separation between us and God, because the spiritual poverty of every single person, because... We are without God's grace, spiritually dead on the inside, and we can't make ourselves alive. It's too great. No one can be as holy as God, and no one can meet the perfect standards of the law. And so all are under sin, he says. It doesn't matter how good one is. So Jew and Gentile are in the same predicament. And then at verse 11, look at this because it is at first shocking. He says this, no one understands, no one seeks for God. It's such a, a strong statement to say that no one's seeking, seeking, because don't we, don't we know people are seeking? Isn't this why people dabble in all the different religions and things and have different ideologies? Aren't people, aren't people seeking? And don't we sometimes just call them seekers? I think the important thing here is that there's a distinction between seeking answers and seeking God. There's a distinction, a difference between seeking blessing for our lives and, and seeking out the person of God, a difference between seeking God and seeking what he might do for you. The uh, prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon, once told a story of a king a farmer and uh, a nobleman, that once upon a time this king ruled over everything, had a, a humble gardener, and uh, that gardener grew an enormous carrot and was so proud of the carrot that he took it to the king and he said, my Lord, this is the greatest carrot I've ever grown or ever will grow, and I want to present it to you as a token of my love and respect for you, my king. And the king was so touched by what this humble gardener on his property did that the king said, you're such a good steward, and I'm so proud of you, and I'm so thankful that I want to give you your own plot of land to farm as freely as you want and provide for you and for your family and for your descendants. And so the gardener was amazed and delighted and went home rejoicing. 
there was a nobleman in the king's court who overheard this whole matter. And so he thought, wow, if that's what you get for a carrot, what might you get for the king if you brought him something bigger? And so he brought to the king his finest horse and presented the big stallion to the king and said, I breed horses and this is the best horse I've ever bred. Take it as a token of my love and respect for you. And the king said, well, thank you. And he dismissed the nobleman. The nobleman was perplexed and the king realized what was going on. So he explained. He said, the farmer, the gardener was giving me a carrot, but you were giving yourself a horse. There's a huge difference, I think, what Paul's saying between knowing God and loving God for who God is and merely seeking benefits from God. So to say no one seeks God is not to say that no one's looking for answers, but it's to say that there's a way in which the spiritual blinders of our lives prevent us in our sin from actually knowing God. How can you seek that which you have not seen or know about? Verse 13, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they've not known. Tongues and lips and mouths and curses and bitterness and violence and wrong path and no peace. This is Paul talking about what theologians call total depravity. It doesn't mean that everything that we do is sinful, but it means that every part of our being has been tainted by sin. Every part of ourselves, the way we think, the way we speak, where we do with our lives, all of it has been clouded. John Calvin said it's as if we are born in sin and we're wearing these sin-tainted spectacles. That everything that you see, you look at it through the lens of your own selfishness. You look at it through the lens of sin and you can't see therefore accurately. How could you see God? How could you see anything accurately if, you, if, if it's all being filtered through your own sin? That, that's what total depravity means. It means, therefore, that something has to happen miraculous. It means you need some new lenses. It means that somebody's got to open up your eyes. It means that, that, that you need rescuing. And at verse 18, we read, there is no fear of God before their eyes. We know the proverb says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I always like what my Uncle Stanley said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but not the end. And it's not fear in the sense of uh, being afraid of God in the sense of you are, you are concerned that he is bad and that therefore he cannot be trusted. It is much more related to amazement that your soul is in such reverence for God and all of his sovereignty and goodness. Psalm 130, verse 3, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. So to have the fear of God is to respect so much that God is the giver of life and that it is only through him that forgiveness can come, that it turns you away from every lesser priority. John Gerstner said that we are too much like a thirsting man in a desert who has begun to see mirages and imagines an oasis, imagines water sources that do not exist and is pursuing the mirage, not knowing that there is real water close by. The mirage keeps you from the real. And this is part of what Paul is saying and building up here in Romans 3, is that therefore, if you realize what is a mirage, you then have a happy day. It may be disappointing to realize that 
trying it your own way hasn't worked. It may be remorseful to your soul when you begin to realize the poverty of your own ability to see what is right and good. But what Paul is leading to here is that this is the best news imaginable. So here comes the good news. Verse 19, verse 19, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So under the law, like being under sin, means that this is the system of your life. It doesn't mean the law is bad. He's already established that. And it's good to do what is good and right. He's established that. But to be under the law means that your system of salvation, your planned path for life is by religiously performing well enough so that you would feel accepted. And it's impossible. What's what he's saying to us? And this is what it means to be under law. It means you have not received the new covenant of the grace of God. So under the law. And here's what he says, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable. For by the works of the law, and here it is, listen carefully, note it well, underline it in your Bible. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. To say that we are all under sin is to say that we are all invited to abandon every false hope in the flesh and to say that it is good news because that until we realize how trapped we are, we will never know how much we need a Savior and we will be forever deceived and we will be exhausted by the effort. So if you're trapped in a cave and you finally realize you cannot escape, then it's the beginning, the dawning of hope in your heart that maybe a rescue will come because you have surrendered yourself to the fact that you can't swim your way out. You can't save yourself. You can't, you can't manufacture it for yourself. You can't, you can't make it happen. And so this is the beginning of it. The mirage is seen for being a, a mirage. And, and this is the beginning point of trusting God. That's what the good news is here. And secondly, it is to say that because no sinner seeks God, that therefore you can take heart, you can receive this good news that if no one ever got saved because they knew how to get to God, then you can trust in this. Anyone who is saved is saved for one reason, and that is God sought them out. So the gospel is not about how able we were to seek God and find him. The gospel is about the love of God who came to seek sinners while we were lost. At great peril, he came to rescue us. And this is good news because what it means is that he's the hero of this story. I, I love rescue stories. I love, I love, I love epic tales. And it's wonderful to, to follow the, the journeys of an Indiana Jones who goes to, to great lengths to find a, a, a lost ark or a hidden treasure, or a Frodo in Lord of the Rings who makes an epic journey, and, and, and though a hobbit is a, is a hero in the end. And, and I love all those, those, those stories. And sometimes we, we read the gospel and we, we put ourselves as if we're on the epic journey and we're the hero, but that's not the story of the gospel. This rescue story, the gospel rescue story, is about God's rescue of us, and it is about the epic rescue that has been performed by Jesus himself, which means that you are the treasure. It, it means that, that you are everything to God and that God, therefore, becomes everything to you. The, the, the movie, 13 Lives, it, 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 if, if the boys had been rescued, uh, had escaped because suddenly they found a secret a avenue out or that they, they were good enough swimmers and they could find occasional pockets there, we would rejoice at that. But what's moving about the story is that these two British cave divers came in as volunteers to try to rescue them. And what they did, they did not because they knew these kids or 
They were getting paid, but just because these kids were trapped and they would certainly die. Verse 19 again, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. And look at this, so that every mouth may be stopped, silenced, made still. Paul's seeing something extraordinary here, that the law was a good gift because it was a revelation of God, but it was also a good gift because the law has put every mouth to silence. No matter the most moral Jewish reader that he had who had lived meticulously trying to keep the law, no reader of his would have kept all the law. And so part of what the law does is it shows us what we can't be. It silences us. It gets us to the point that we quit so frantically trying to be our own Savior. Here's what's so shocking about that rescue is that they found the boys on the 10th day and they realized the problem had only begun. Yes, those cave divers would be able to lead some other Navy SEALs now on the way. Yes, they would be able to get some provisions to them. Yes, that would happen, but the, the waters were continuing to fill. Time was limited. Air was limited. How in the world would they get these exhausted boys and their coach out of there on a two-and-a-half-mile dive that would take over six hours to get to the mouth of the cave. Boys that are exhausted and weak, and you know what it's like when someone feels like they're drowning. They are frantic. They are thrashing. They knew the boys would make it impossible for the divers to do their rescue work. Hundreds of volunteers are trying to mitigate the problem, there's so much going on, but these two, these two cave divers, Stanton and Valanthan, they realized that they needed to call a friend. Another excellent cave diver, an Australian that they knew, he came and offered to help, but then they looked at him and they said, we've called you here not just to help with the dive, but because of your special expertise. And then it dawned on him. The Australian was a doctor, an anesthesiologist. And what they were proposing was to administer sedation, general anesthesia, to each boy so that they would be unconscious during the rescue. The anesthesiologist realized there may be no other way and that probably most of these boys would die, but he agreed to it. And they went back and took the first boy, didn't tell him what they were doing, but gave him an injection, a little concoction of several medications and put a mask over his face and would pause to make sure the mask didn't lose its place and... Two other times, a diver would have to stop and give an injection through the wetsuit in order to keep him sedated thoroughly to make it all the way. And that's what they did for kid after kid and for the coach. They put him to sleep so that when they were silenced, they could let themselves be saved. It's an interesting story. We won't take time to look at it in Genesis. After God has called Abraham and promised him that he'd be the father of a nation in Genesis 12, then in Genesis 15, he comes back and he reaffirms his covenant with Abraham. And in the text, God essentially puts Abraham into a trance where he can't move as if he's asleep. And God appears to him and says, no, for sure that I'm blessing you. I think that salvation is something like that, that the transfer of the righteousness of Jesus Christ to us is dependent 
upon our mouths being silenced, our, our own righteousness being recognized for its poverty, and the need that is impossible of perfection over our lives such that we're silenced in any attempt to be worthy in God's eyes. And when we come to that point and we are surrendered into the hands of God, that's when he is able to do what he's always longed to do, and that is to save us, to rescue us and carry us into new life. Verse 21, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction. Here's the final and the best news of all of this text, is that while we're all the same apart from Christ, we're under sin because we're under the law and we could never escape. What it also means is that in Jesus Christ, we have seen the revelation of righteousness and we have received that as Christians by faith, not by merit, so that in the end there's no distinction and we have all been, we have all been saved in the same way and we all become children of God in the same way and we're all the recipients of the same grace. And therefore, Paul says in, in Galatians, he says, therefore, we, we are one in Christ. Therefore, he says, there's no Jew or Greek. He, there's no one who, oh, you had all the advantages in the, amongst the Jewish people and you had the laws that, no, and you, you were in the same predicament as the Gentile was, but now the Gentile, he can say to the one who didn't have all of that, in Christ, you're all the same. We're all the same because we have this one Savior. No male, no female, no Jew, no Greek. You once were the same because you're under sin, and now you're the same because you're under grace. When you're under grace, it changes everything in your life. The manifestation of righteousness of Apart from the law means that Jesus has come. It means the Savior has come. It means the rescuer has come. So that all of the attention of the story, all of the attention of our lives, it's upon the rescuer. It, it, it's, it should be as silly as anything to think of any of our own merits when the rescue has come only through the person of Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's, that's what's so extraordinary about the gospel. It's all Jesus and his righteousness, none of our own. But when you're saved and rescued, you're brought out into the glorious light and you breathe and you're free and you live under grace. That's what Jesus has done for us. And that's the gospel.